Connecticut and Massachusetts, ZM Homes buys houses. Sell your property to the local guys. Needs repairs, updates, maybe foreclosure or inherited? No problem. We got gotcha. you. Google or add us on Facebook at ZandmHomes.com. Bexy's musical podcast. Crazy stars, it's useless. Okay, I need you to bear with me for a little bit because I'm about to bulldoze my way into some shameless fanboy territory. As you know, I never shy away from talking about my favorite bands, and today. It's going to be one of those days. For as long as I can remember, I have been a huge fan of the band Killing Joke. Since 1979, Killing Joke has been arguably one of the most intense, most powerful, and perhaps one of the most intimidating bands in the world. This is a band that is tribal, cerebral, visceral, and volatile as hell. And I cannot tell you how many times I've gone back to the Killing Joke well, where I'll pull out their debut album, or their 1981 follow-up, What's This For?, or 1985's Nighttime, or 1990's Extremities Dirt and Various Repressed Emotions. Each one just devastating. And in my compulsive need for completionism, Killing Joke is among those bands that has not released a single record that I don't have, and that's a fact. It's a band that's been cited by Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, Nirvana, Metallica, Nine Inch Nails, and many others as being hugely influential. In fact, in 2003, Killing Joke released a self-titled album featuring Dave Grohl on drums, and it's a freaking beast. My guest today is original bass player Youth, also known as Martin Glover. Youth is not only a founding member of Killing Joke, he's also one of the most sought-after music producers in the world. After leaving Killing Joke in 1983, Youth would go on to work on projects with the likes of Pink Floyd, Guns N' Roses, U2, Kate Bush, Susie and the Banshees, In Excess, Crowded House, and dozens and dozens of others, including the biggest hit of his producing career, 1997's Grammy-nominated international hit, Bittersweet Symphony by The Verve. He was also involved in an experimental project in 1993 called The Fireman, which combined rock and electronica, and his partner in that project was Paul McCartney of The Beatles, a collaboration that yielded three terrific albums until 2008. But yet it's been killing joke that's been a central part of his musical career, returning to the band several times, but rejoining permanently in 2010 following the death of bass player Paul Raven, the very guy who replaced him in 1983. And in rejoining Jazz Coleman, Jordy, and Big Paul Ferguson, the band's original lineup has released three albums, which are arguably some of the best and most powerful recordings of their entire career. I think what I'm trying to tell you is that he is not only the real deal, he's the freaking bass player in Killing Joke. This is my conversation with producer Martin Glover, youth from Killing Joke on Baxi's Musical Podcast. How Hi. you doing? Very good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? That's better. Um, yeah, not bad, not bad. Just a bit of running around. Sorry I'm late. Don't, don't you worry about a thing. It's great to talk to you. Yeah. Hey, well, I want to, yeah. I want to, uh, I want I need to thank you very much for that email. That was, uh, very very cool a couple of days ago you sent uh, an email and i'm glad you got a chance to to listen to an episode or two it just it, to, to hear the feedback from a guy like you is really awesome well that, that was outstanding i mean i've heard a couple since and actually they were really good the uh paul wexler one was excellent but that carlos alomar one i sent it to a couple of friends <laughs> and i mean just what he goes through in that and he's so like machine gun about it. He's so fast, doesn't he? Yeah, but he is. In fact, I was talking about it last night to a friend because I was saying, oh, you know, the bit where he goes on about um, fame, you know, and he, he came up with a riff and he, he said he nicked the riff from somewhere, didn't he? And, I, and my friend said, oh, no, because I, I said, yeah, he, he co I think he got a writer credit on fame. And he said, no, no, that's a James Brown riff. I said, I think that's where he nicked it. I can't really, can you remember what he, where he got it from? It's it's so funny to hear how you, you know, the humility uh, in his personality and, and the, the humble nature yeah. of the guy. It's really, really yeah, yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out, outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. Just want to settle yeah. in for this. 
I mean, because you've really raised the bar on that one, so I'm like, I've got to be on my toes. <laughs> no, you. I'm listen. I am so excited to talk to you. I mean, I mean, to be able to talk, you know, about your career as a as a producer alone is thoroughly mind blowing. But you know, to talk to uh, to talk about Killing Joke with someone who has been <laughs> Killing Joke, it's like, you know, where do you even start with that? Uh, you know, it's like one of those bands that I always find myself going back to. If I need like uh, some ass kicking in my life, I go to Killing Joke. If I've had a bad day at work, I go to Killing Joke. Maybe not outside the gate of that spoken word record, but everything else mm. just has completely landed on me for forever. And 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 to talk to you about it is a real honor. So I, I appreciate you being open to do it. No problem. One of the, uh, the amazing things, and I don't know if it's ever if it gets talked about enough, is I think Killing Joke is maybe one of the, the few bands. In, in history that has become more intense and punishing the older you guys have gotten. That's, that doesn't happen with anybody. I mean, you guys are all at the age now where you know, after all this time, you start to, to slow down and the intensity drops through the floor, but that has never been about what killing joke is about. Tell me about that. Cause I, I find it really interesting that you guys have just amped the game up over the years. Well, I mean, that's a huge uh, compliment and affirmation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I think because we're, we're aware of our legacy, maybe, um, and we're aware that that legacy only gets more relevant as as we go through time and, and the world becomes more the way it is, more more difficult. That relevance makes it feel worthwhile in a way because. Um, you know, when we were making those records at the time, late 70s, early 80s, people people thought we were sort of a bit pessimistic or something. We always thought we were just honest, you right. know. But now people just wouldn't say that. They'd just say, oh, yeah, that's... But I think it's... Um, we try and, you know, make music of its of, of its time, you know. So wherever we're at, what, where we're at, where the world is at, that informs what we're doing. So... I think because the world's got more intense and there's more, you know, untruth and more war and more manipulation and more control, more regulation, more restrictions, that makes it more poignant for us to sort of go uh, harder and heavy. I, I think it's, it's you know, it's like, a, it's a strange parallel. But funnily enough, when we start, people... We take a lot of acid at our gigs. We were known as an as an as an, a, a, a psychedelic <laughs> band. I mean, in the same way, I suppose a lot of people would have taken acid to the doors back in the day, right? Even though they were a darker band, you know, maybe not Sabbath, but the Doors, <laughs> but probably Sabbath as well, actually. But um, you know, and that that psychedelic element, I feel. It's often sort of people they don't get it or they don't they don't focus on that. They focus on the harder, more brutal side of the band. But there's um, the psychedelia in it is is kind of what makes it medicine to us, yeah. you know, in, in terms of what the functionality of it is. And it's being able to sort of swallow that poison, throw it up, you know, and, and become stronger for it. I think. I sense one of the other things that that's, uh, you know, is is amazing to me is you were 18 years old when you when you joined this band with with Jazz and Paul and and, and Jordy and you know you all have very individualistic powerful personalities and, and points of view that's you know very very clear but there's this there's this bond that runs between the four of you musically and spiritually and psychedelically or whatever it may be and it's something that you carved out almost from the very beginning. It, Tell me a little bit about that because sometimes bands need time to find their voice and it's found it sounds like you guys found the voice within like the first 15 minutes of playing with each other. It's so bizarre. I was saying that the other day that some of the best music I made I made when I was a teenager didn't know what I was doing. So I don't know what that is. Uh with Killing Joke, yeah, four very very different alpha males. You know, four bulls in one pen. You know, not a lot of friction. I think the rub of that is where a lot of the magic is. And, and where also a lot of the unity 
and the harmony comes from the resilience of those opposites colliding and you know it's in that respect it's never been easy for us but at the same time it's almost effortless when it does happen it takes us all by surprise and it just comes out um all of us individually are equally surprised by it um and, and that's a magic to it i don't it defies a kind of intellectual you know examination of i mean i know jazz just doesn't bother but there are points where we meet and they're unusual points like disco we all love disco <laughs> <laughs> but there are opposites as well me geordie and myself we love 60s 70s pop you know whether it's um you know smoky or you know even sort of loungy sort of easy listening stuff um <laughs> whereas jazz absolutely hates anything pop and paul, and paul also you know jazz just doesn't like much music other than his own generally <laughs> he likes a bit of funk and that's about it yeah uh, paul's very much more of a you know hard rock metal head you know and doesn't listen to much else i mean he does he he likes um quite a lot of world music actually um okay. we share that taste but uh and he likes a bit of disco but we all have very different tastes um but they eclipse where they eclipse is where that kind of weird chemistry comes from i, I suppose so when i when i'm with them when we're when we're working and writing i, I always try and include those opposite elements because i sense that's what what we are even though whenever we did that in the past i at the beginning i always thought nobody would un, would get killing joke i was surprised it connected because it was sort of genre blind and it was you know it was juxtaposed opposites disco and metal and punk and post punk you know just um i just thought you know it's only us who will get that but actually people loved it and i think even more so now so I, you know I, I kind of i try and keep an eye on keeping those weird opposites in there somehow nevertheless some people with killing joe we each take the sort of lead baton sometimes and when that person's pushing the disco may get ignored and or something else with my, you know, yeah. or vice versa. To me, it's kind of like a, like an extended Venn diagram. There's, you know, there's four circles and everything kind of meets all in the middle and that small little yeah. pocket. That's, that's what killing joke does. And I think, you know, as a fan for me, I think what, what separates all of that from, you know, you talk about the, the genre part of it is killing joke does kind of defy, defy all of that because it, it really is so much of its own thing. And it's a sound that no one has been able to replicate. An atmosphere that no one's been able to replicate. Yeah, well, jazz is very good with a bad vibe, I must say. You know, <laughs> he's one of the great frontmen, and he he can express his terror and fear and paranoia very articulately. And Paul generally helps him with the lyrics, but between them with the lyrics, jazz can really inhabit that character yeah. uh, and personality and project it very well and it is you know it is quite special and unique you know and uh and it's very emotional you know so you know it doesn't often what we do it might appear wrong someone may present a riff or somewhere we start jamming and we get and jazz being ah, and then we get into it and then something else happens and jazz just starts singing and it's you know, it's like channeling or it's very magical. And there is a lot of magical intent there, even though between us, we all have very, very different um, spiritual expressions, you know. Um, but we always do a little circle before we go on stage. I tend to lead that, um, but everybody contributes. And all those different things go into the mix. I think what is lovely is it's, we grew up coming up out of West London counterculture. The birth of counterculture in Europe was kind of elaborate growth in the 70s. And we grew up in a very multicultural city, London, West London. When I was at school, St. Augustine's, West London, 
white people are in the minority by far, far more Jamaican, West Indian and Indian cultural backgrounds. And, and so in that climate, disco, reggae, black music became more of our soundtrack in many ways. So it, the band reflects that within our disparate personalities. We're also different and opposite, yet yeah, we, we can accept that and we can support each other's differences and we can get unity with ourselves by including all that. Rather, people find in politics, whatever, unity comes from them forcing their idea on everybody else and everybody else agreeing with it. We grew up in a culture where multiculturally we could do all those things and celebrate the differences. And that, I think, is very important today you know, politically and personally, um, because the world needs more unity and harmony. There's, the, you know, the, the politics of today is very divisive and very, you know, consciously divisive. And um, we've got more separation and, and loneliness than ever before. So things that pull us together, you know, uh, music is, you know, one of the best things of doing that. You're bringing people together and, and, and getting everybody to see, you know, we're, we're all the same, really. And, and we're more, you know, jazz is quarter Indian as well. So we're a multi-ethnic band. That was very rare in, in those days. And uh, all of that, I think, is, is kind of amped to the extreme within the circle of the band. I understand what you're getting at, because, you know, I know here in the States, the division between you know, people here is so divided and that conversation collaboration, it, it almost seems like a, like a lost art and, and to have you know, such different you know, points of view and personalities and then to still be able to do it. That's not something you'd find very often here in, in the U S and I would assume probably in the, in, in great Britain too, that everyone is just kind of, you know, focused on their own opinion and, and imply uh, and applying that to everybody else. That's why great bands split up. They become successful and then they don't have to have an argument with the drummer about which direction the song goes in or whatever. They can just do it the way their own way. But often it's a law of diminishing returns and there's only a handful of artists that you could, I can think of that have transcended and exceeded the achievements they made with the bands they became famous with. Yeah. I mean, not even Mick Jagger can do it all of them. You know, McCartney can, but not Mick Jagger. Right. Yeah, very few people can. I I just rewatched yeah. the uh, the Death and Re- Resurrection show documentary. Oh that, my god! That came out about ten years ago. I've probably seen yeah. it like two or three times already. But you know the, the the story of the formation of the band is is somewhat legendary. And Jazz and Paul used ancient rituals and ceremonial magic to kind of bring you guys together. When when you joined the band, did you have any sense of skepticism about that, or or did you believe that there was something larger involved? Oh, I was totally skeptical. I'm, I'm, you know, without getting two spinal snap about it, but <laughs> I'm the earth element, you know, I'm the Capricorn in the band. So my role at that point was to be a sardonic, cynical element to the, you know, mysticism of jazz and Paul, especially at 18, 19. And, uh, you know, because I was really the only Londoner in the band. Mm-hmm. So the other guys were a little bit provincial, I thought. You know, Jazz still had a feather in his barrow, you know. And <laughs> and I had to style Geordie, cut his hair off and bleach it. And I was kind of like, you know, fully immersed in punk at that point. Right. So, yeah, I was very cynical. And But then I started taking a lot of psychedelics and culminating... You know, 21 in 1982 sort of having this meltdown on the king's road having a full sid barrett burning money on the road in a kimono i was arrogant i thought i was a bit too middle class and normal to ever lose it yeah and i i, I was really into jim morrison and the doors i thought there's no way i'm going to do a jim morrison i was it's just i could take a, a bucket so i said it wouldn't make any difference just too normal <laughs> And and I was very cynical about spirituality or anything. I was like really uh, nihilistic in many ways. And um, but this acid meltdown I had ended up me being in a mental hospital for two weeks. 
and having the spiritual awakening coming out of that tapping into sort of other dimensions i don't know it was some really crazy stuff going on all the magic suddenly that was surrounding killing joke that i'd been taking the piss out of suddenly became real to the point where i could look at a sewage cover on the street and see these masonic mystical patterns and be able to put my hands in a certain position and turn a street light off with my mind and think i could do crazy stuff like that but actually in the in the meltdown coming out of the hospital i had two people around me brian barrett who'd written a book with timothy leary lee harris who'd started the first head shop and homegrown magazine in london in the 70s they were both kind of shaman figures and they would tell me that I wasn't mad. I was going through a shamanic initiation. All shamanic initiations require a sort of wounding in the in the Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces sort of perception. So that was my wounding and it was a complete ego shredding and I had to kind of rebuild myself back and it took a few years. Um, and you know, I became very cautious about it. And 10 years later, I'm in living in Goa. I had a house in Goa in India, which is a psychedelic community with, you know, liquid LSD from California, a lot of Americans, <laughs> no rules. And that's where, you know, psychedelic trance emerged from. And I was a pioneer of promoting that and, and making that. And then I got back into it. And prior to that was Acid House in London, where ecstasy had become a big drug which I dabbled with but very cautiously. But what it gave me, that breakdown, was a deep spiritual appreciation for nature. I mean, so much so it led me to joining a Druid order and studying it and studying shamanism from the mushroom guy. What it also did, and I was saying this to Jazz recently, is that the thread that runs through Killing Joke throughout the, where the continuity is spiritually is essentially triple goddess and triple goddess is a kind of robert graves concept it's been de debunked by certain esoteric cultures and oh uh, scholars or but others i appreciate it but um it's this goddess based um nature based uh worship yeah. uh, or not much or, or, or system so and it's very poetic and it fits with the druid thing and um to me that's where most of the songs spiritual heart lay is in a, a devotional thing to her so now that's a radical thing for me to say i mean some members of the band may disagree with me but jazz agreed with me when i mentioned it recently well they, i mean there's a sequence in, in the documentary which i don't know if it leads into that but it certainly leads into this idea that something else is going on and all four of you are are a part of this in a way where a lot of people might just not be able to understand because they haven't experienced that kind of awakening. But there's this, uh, there's this sequence in the, in the film about this gig in uh, the, the Reading Hexagon back in 1980, yeah. Yeah. where you're like five songs deep into this gig, and then all of a sudden something, something changes or, or opens mm -hmm. up, and it, you're, you're all having this out-of-body experience simultaneously. I, explain that if, if you can, because I think okay. a lot of people have a hard I've time got, getting I, it. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I've got my theories on that. Um, you know, I, this was just before I had the the acid meltdown. Okay. But I was tripping off my nuts at the, that point. From the middle of What's This For, through touring that, and then just before Revelations. Uh, that, Revelations was after, but that album has that magic in it, and what I found, you know, like I said earlier, was we were a psychedelic band. You go to the toilet at a Killing Joe gig, there'd be guys outside the toilet going, acid, speed, hash, you know. Uh, and there was a lot of acid at the gigs. And um, people are horrified when I say that now. <laughs> you know, the idea of tripping to Killing Joe. But actually, it works really well. And I used to take <laughs> acid a lot on stage because I get bored with doing the same set every night. I'd want a different light show. I just did it just to, you know, I was exploring, experimenting. And um, at that particular show, and also I was playing the fretless precision, which meant that often I was just slightly under the note or above it, and it gave it a certain dissonance frequency-wise. I think that really added to the magical um, ritual of it. And some of those 
like weird dissonance bass tones could actually affect the cosmos in that space and my theory was when the intensity of the gig got so intense we go into what we call later called white out which where it could just go silent and we go it would look like everything was in slow motion and there'd just be this hiss and then it suddenly go back in really loud like like you've been sucked back into it was almost like you punctured into a different dimension but collectively and what was weird was that the audience and everyone in the band were, were aware of it i thought it was just me because i've been taking acid but yeah. it wasn't there are pictures of that hexagon gig where i look like so calm like almost like a baby asleep on stage and there's almost like a riot going on around me and I was in this state of grace in the center of this storm and often channeling a lot of this energy, you know, and, you know, the earth element rooting it down into the ground, you know. So that's my theory. Yeah. I think the thing that's so fascinating, <laughs> I, yeah, well, and, 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 and I'm, I think the thing that's so fascinating is if it were just one of you, maybe two of you, you could say, well, then it was just the psychedelics. Yeah, alone. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that all yeah. four of you simultaneously cite this has ha as a, having yeah. happened, and the audience, and the audience felt it afterwards. Yeah. When they go, "What was that silent thing?" You know, everything went weird. Well, that's my only kind of rational explanation for it. Happened again when we went to the pyramids. I had the idea of us recording in the pyramids, and I had a contact through um, the uh, great mix of Bob Clearmount and his ex girlfriend Mary. Uh, oh was was a white witch in new york and ran she managed the power plant and she had given that up to and split up with him and gone to live in cairo and had access to these secret chambers under the pyramids and was doing meditations there with her, her esoteric group he gave me a number and i said can you get us in we want to do some recording and she got us in and it was just me and jazz and an engineer with some dats and um but again time behaved weirdly inside there the machines all the dat batteries video batteries drained in two three minutes and there were two hour batteries weird mystical phenomena happened and again it was a bit like taking dmt or uh, you know you, i think that allowed us to kind of tap into so i don't know other dimensions other energies who knows i have this but it was very similar to the white out experience and I think, again, there's that intensity of intention that can create the peak experience. I've read a lot of um, Colin Wilson books. Most of his books are based about peak experience and how to switch it on and off. Mm. And I've studied that in depth because that's kind of what I have to do with, with as a producer is to create the best out of the artist and create these peak experiences that... Um, you know, that we can flick on and off with a switch every day. And so he had some interesting ideas about that. But I think an intensity of intention is essential. And of course, that's what ritual does. It sort of, it, it kind of really solidifies and focuses some your intention. To get that peak intention that you're, you're talking about and then being able to apply it to your, your career as a producer, I would imagine that, I mean, there have to be certain things that you've done to, to kind of create that in, in a studio with other artists who may or may not share that same experience. How do you provide that in, in a studio with, with other artists or, or can you provide it to that, to that degree? Um, I just, when I'm working as a producer, most of it's subliminal and subconscious and I might be doing that, but the band may not be aware of it. Um, and there may be an occasion where, I mean, even just sitting down to dinner in a circle can be a magical thing and how you conduct the conversation and and discuss intentions and uh, and philosophies it can be just as powerful in, in some ways. And um, more on a personal level, I might get, develop a more personal relationship with the artist and we'll discuss spirituality and ideas. And we'll, that will enter into the narrative and conversation and come into it. But uh, more often than not, it's, it's it's a subliminal thing. And as it is with Killing Joke, although occasionally we will do, you know, actual, you know, ceremonies. And often when we're on tour in the UK, we'll 
we'll do a, a pit stop on a stone circle and, and do a little circle and ceremony. We used to do it a lot in the early days and take bongos out, take mushrooms and sit in an old Neolithic burial chamber playing drums with incense, <laughs> you know, and, and just, you know, and yeah. we're, we're, you know, we would, but like I was saying earlier, oh, our own expression of spirituality is very different from each other, but we share certain things and we, we can be inclusive in, and multi faith in in that sense and it doesn't have to be one way or, or another everybody be, can be involved and i think um you know what i do when, when i take artists to my studio space mountain in andalusia spain there's a we're above this r ravine that's like a very narrow gorge but quite high up 100 meters 150 meters kind of a little tiny grand canyon and it's you know and it's it's a real goddess site and there's a lot of snakes and there's a little spring and a stream when you but it's incredible it's like a roger dean landscape it's all been water <laughs> it's fantastic and I, I i often take the band down there and we, we'll walk through that and that in itself is an initiation you know i've realized the connection between environment geography land uh, yeah and your own mental space state and the creative process can be often interlinked Killing joke often work well in, in dark, you know, dystopian urban environments, but everybody works well in a in a, in a fierce nature yeah. environment in the desert or like this or ravine or something. That will come in and inform the work and, and become part of that ritual. I think. Um so you see, you know, it happens like that. I think if if I made it really overt and said, look, we've got to do a ceremony before we start, and we have to do, you know, smudge the room, you know, but I think people, the bands were often very cynical, you know, like I was when I was a teenager. You know, they'd be that would be counterproductive, and it'll be a bit, um, you know, imposing of me and my belief system onto them. I, I'm I'm not necessarily. I'm trying to apply that system to myself and, and hopefully that will help me facilitate their art. So I'm not there to evangelize what I'm into. Now, I won't talk about it unless people really ask me about it. Yeah. Because it's a, a very private, you know, expression, but I'm happy to do that. But I think in the working professional environment, it's better to be kept um, a cold, a hidden, you know, in, well, not hidden, but not, you know, sub subliminal. But in any kind of collaboration, though, you still need a, a certain level of open mindedness, not only on the artist part, but then your part, too, because, I mean, you know, they're the artists. They have their own vision of what they, they want, and, and you're there to provide that and to not make them make them fall apart and go crazy trying to trying to accomplish that. Yeah, I mean, everybody, everyone, every artist needs a different, you know, um, being open-minded doesn't necessarily go with being an artist. <laughs> no, I know. True. <laughs> but um, and most of the time, halfway through an album, I'll ask every member of the band individually, how do you feel the album's going and what's your vision? And they, they always go, well, my bass could be louder. Can you turn the drums up? <laughs> yeah. So they're, in that, when they're in the trenches in a band, that's what they're thinking about. My job is to have the further perspective to see the big picture, if you like. But often I'm surprised the artist doesn't, you know, even the main writers may not, will not have a vision of that. Some really do. I just had a meeting with a young band and they, they map out their album before they've even written the songs. We need an ambient one to start, a big hit single and a darker one. You know, some people can do it like that. But most bands don't. They just have a collection of ideas which are half, you know, gone through. And hopefully, you know, the producer will help them get to a point where they're complete and definitive ideas and recorded, you know. And that's part of my, that's a big part of my job, you know, um, to, is to help facilitate that. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm not like it's my way or the high. I'll have a vision. Absolutely, I have a vision all the time. But if it, the job demands that, I'm just facilitating their vision or one of the writer's vision. I'll try and do that. It's, I'm, I worked with String Cheese Incident years ago, who are like a deadhead band, you right. know. They'll, they'll kick me for saying that a bit, but <laughs> in that they had a very similar kind of structure and they're like five solo members 
they'd all play on each other's songs, but they were definitely each each member had their songs, you know. And you know, so and they were, you know, all very different as well. And um, you know, and and they all had their own vision for that. And then, you know, I was like, look, I don't want it just to be like your American quilt patchwork deadhead car, you know, thing, you know, because <laughs> we've heard that <laughs> a lot. <laughs> You know, so I was introducing them to sort of uh, emerging electronica of the late 90s, things like, you know, Spongel and what people were listening to in India, taking acid, people who took acid, what were they were listening to in Europe? Yeah. You know, it wasn't the dead by then, you know, it was other stuff. <laughs> and, try, you know, pushing them to include that in to the mix to make them contemporary, you know, and, and make transcend the kind of, ghetto they found themselves in even though it was a big but it worked and the album was the first album they got reviewed in rolling stone and spin and definitely pushed them into another league you know but it's you know it's kind of working with all those different visions is that was quite polarized on that one but you know i have to be in that respect i have to be the the, the prism that all those lights shine through and i my you know i love that thing carlos alomar said on his interview where there's a there's a sense of obligation and responsibility when you're working with music or being a musician to to learn how to do it and do it properly. And, you know, and that's, you know, the same as for me as a producer. My responsibility is to focus all those elements, create a definitive statement that, you know, the band um, is going to really help the band. Yeah, I mean, I think of a, a, like a, a situation like you had with The, the Verve. The Bittersweet Symphony was a, was a massive international hit. Yeah, and, and and I assume maybe even the the biggest hit single that that you might have been a part of as a oh, producer. Sure. You know, it's impossible to predict how something is going to you know land once you've you know released it. But when you finish a song like that, and you know you've helped these guys along, you know, put together the biggest hit of their career, and you play it back after it's finally done, what goes through your head when you hear something like that? Because you know. When a when a fan hears that on on a radio, they say, "My God, what a great hit!" But as someone who's in it and really close to it, what was your sense of in that moment of what you had just completed? Well, that's a good example because it's never as straightforward or simple as that. Sure, you know? I wish it could be, but it, it isn't. And with that song, particularly, the Richard had actually the band had split up. Richard had signed a solo deal, re-employed the band as session musicians on his solo album and that was for me one of the biggest songs but Richard had fallen out with it he didn't like it and he you know I'd cut it but he didn't want me to work on it and forbidden me to work on it expressly he um why was that he just fell out so I just fall hmm. out of love with the songs often many of the artists I work with absolutely hate the singles that define and become the cornerstone of a 30-year career for them that still hate it. It's the same with my band. Jazz hates Love Like Blood, you know, just hates it. <laughs> I have to twist his arm to play it all the time. It's the same with 80s, although I can always generally get Geordie on the side of 80s because it's one of his great riffs, but you know, neither of them want to play them generally. Most of the time I have to really push them. And um <laughs> And I didn't even play on those records, you know, but right. I love the song. But, you know, often bands like uh, with Embrace, a great British band in the late 90s, um, I had a big number one song with them called Come Back to What You Know. And again, Danny just would not, hated the song, didn't want to cut it, didn't want to do anything. And I had to cut some a weird deal where I said I'd do this other song, which I knew Good Good People, which is a great record and everybody loved. I said, I'll only do that if we can cut, come back to what you know as well. And that was one example. I've never had to do that again. But sometimes I do. Or sometimes I just have to use a lot of stealth and cunning, you know. And uh, with Bit of Sweet, I actually, when Richard was in the studio, I pull it out, pull the tapes out and kept, kept tracking it, even put the strings on it, even got it to a really good mix state. And then on a playback with publishers and managers, I said, look, it was all going great and the wine was flowing and everybody was really happy. And I said, yeah, I did a bit of work on Bit of Sweet, Richard, can I give you a blast, see if you like it, it's sounding good. And he was like, yeah. Right. And then, you know, he dropped and everybody went crazy and, you know, and he, he fell in love with it again. And um, 
and you know i had to go through a long a really long process to get it to the point where he really loved it again for it to even be in considered considered for inclusion you know so people don't see any of that when they hear the record for the first they just hear a classic timeless record and many people put that in the top 10 of the best ever singles every month but that's what sometimes you have to do there's that great story of uh, sound of silence simon garfunkel you know the first time they heard it they were on tour and it was number one in the us and and the uk and it, they'd never heard or even known about the orchestra going on it you know and I think most artists love the idea of that and would love that. But actually, these days would be horrified because it would be a complete control issue. You know, that it just wouldn't happen. But And these days, you don't really have managers or producers that will, will go those distances and lengths to, for the art to, to make that happen. They'll just often just go, yes, they'll just be yes men. They don't have the vision of that. So it's a rare thing. And I think it was a rare thing then, yeah. you know. So I don't, it's a, it's a, it's a fifth dimension thing. I, I, it's a very hard thing to quantify and articulate. But those those songs and those tracks have a, their own manner, their own mojo, you know. And sometimes when that's super strong, even the author can't stop it. And, and and often with many records, bands I've worked with make great records that, again, they hated. Yeah. Big hit. It takes them 20 years to work out what it is about that before they start liking it. It's funny that you bring it up, you know, having worked a number of times with Paul McCartney, a guy who must who must face that all the time. There must be songs that, that he's done over the years. We go, oh, geez, I can't believe I got to, I can't believe I got to sing that horrible freaking song again. <laughs> but but that's a but that's a guy who one of the most profound musical artists in in history must face that constantly. You know, and, and I've had a chance to listen to a little bit of the of the Fireman records that uh, that you had done with him. Tell me about you know, working with him and 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 uh, and, and the experience of, of that. Well, I mean, it's a very different experience than working with a young band on the first album. You know, when yeah. you're working with artists of that caliber, and of course, there's a whole different way of approaching that george martin famously said the art production is all about tax and diplomacy and he's right because it's the very easy mannered smooth talking producers that can coax that out of them you know yeah. um but you still you know one of the reasons those records were so good was because their producers were quite tough and george martin would be constantly pushing their bar up to make sure the songs were right um as lou golden did with the stones and you know all the all the all the other great producers they work with would do the same you know it's a great um film of the recording of symphony for the devil in olympic mm -hmm. yeah um, jean luc goddard directed and you see the process of how that comes about i think it's i think jack Nietzsche is in the room and joe wexler is it or what uh or miller i think was the producer they came up with the idea you know that charlie watts got fed up and gone home and they <laughs> took over the rhythm and he played drums on it and got the conga going and that changed the vibe and then it became the hit it you know and it, it really illustrates as does the get back uh series oh, i know you see people composing and putting together all those songs um from just little threads you can see how those songs have a a, a kind of evolution and a process of distillation before they become these incredible finished classics also, I think, you know, when I'm working with Paul, a lot of the time with the Beatles, um, they work fast. I work fast. I like work fast. I think it's, it's, a, it's a commitment of confidence to work fast. And I like the way Dylan would work fast and just throw it down. Not to say that I'm not afraid of a bit of uh, crafting and polishing what you get, but the actual performances, you don't want... They, they, you know, music doesn't lie. It's a mirror. If it, it sounds arduous and torturous and takes forever, 
that's because it did, you know. And, <laughs> you know, a lot of those great records were made very, very fast and yeah. written fast as well. And um, and that energy, you know, stays in the artifact as manner, as spirit, you know. And, yeah. uh, so I, try, I, I, I have a really great team of engineers that I've trained up personally so we can work really fast and keep the artist engaged and, and not bored and inspired and on, on the edge and, and challenging and pushing them all the way, challenging them on the song and the middle eight, the bridge, you know, everything, just making sure everything is there that's supposed to be there. And if there isn't something there that's missing, well, let's get it. You know, so yeah. that's how we approach it. Now, that's controversial because... You know, in the UK, you get like it's, a, it, it's common for producers to be like that in some ways. But in America, it's much more a corporate. I've worked in America on sessions and stuff where the engineers refer to the producer and the artist as sir, and it's it's very business like. <laughs> you know, sort of um, obviously not all of it. It's a lot more so than like London or something, or maybe not so much now, but then. Um, so. I think in that culture, there's culture of, you know, if you want it that way, yes, sir, let's do it that way, you know. Right. Uh, whereas if you're in with Trevor Horn here, he'd be going, no, that's that's terrible. We're not doing it that way. It's got to be this way, you know, and have right. a listen to the, you know. And, and obviously there are great American producers who are pushy like that, and, but uh, and artists. Uh, but I, I think that's good sometimes. I think... Our great artists need to be challenged. One of my theories why those great artists like McCartney, Stones, ACDC even don't make great records anymore is because my theory is they don't have managers that have a vested interest. Their managers are on a big wage of a few hundred grand a year and they just say yes and make it happen. And when you have managers that if the record wasn't good and going to sell, they wouldn't get paid. They made sure it worked. It, it's so easy for people, to, you know, you can imagine going in with Van Morrison and saying, well, I don't think the song's working. Can we try it like this? He'd just <laughs> laugh at you, tell you to pop off, do another take and go home, you know. Right. There's something amazing about that as well. You know, I love that. But it's, it's kind of finding that balance where there's enough challenge for the my responsibilities to the music. I mean, I'm employed by the artists and the label, but my real responsibilities to the music and the song. If I get if I get the music right and everything flows, if I try and just make the label right happy or the artist happy, then it don't work. Yeah. You know, you know, you have to have a lot of courage and uh, fearlessness to to be able to do that, and you have to have skills in tact and diplomacy to present it in a way that's not going to tell. You know, I have Van Morrison to tell you to fuck off, you know. Right. Well, I think when it comes to like a like a Paul McCartney, the legend looms so large with that guy that it, there's probably nobody in his world that doesn't think, oh, my God, that's Paul McCartney. And, you know, he must get that all the time. And to work with somebody who is going to challenge a Paul McCartney, someone who has the bravery to to say, hey, Paul, why don't you try doing it this way? It'll be so much better. You know? You know, that yeah. that takes a special kind of thing to kind of get that legacy out of your mind and say, here's a guy I'm working with. Let's challenge each other. Can't be too many people in the world that do that. Not many artists will have the courage to bring that on. But I think with Paul, with with the with work I did with him, it was very he was very clever in that we did it as the fireman, which was an anonymous group, which so he could take off his Paul McCartney hat. Yeah. And just be Paul or someone else for a minute <laughs> and and so those considerations that would come into play for a Paul McCartney solo record wouldn't be there which gave me a lot more freedom and allowed me to direct him in a more experimental way with him being totally up for that because it, there was no pressure there so that was clever I mean he actually told me that's what they did with Sergeant Peppers Sergeant Peppers he it was his idea to be an imaginary band so they could not be the Beatles for a minute. And yeah, it's so clever. Um, 
and uh, you know i think uh yeah i mean more bigger artists should try that i mean you can pretend when you're in the studio so you know when i'm directing singers when they're doing vocals i might say you know every take i'll give them a different emotional direction i might say i'll just have an angry one or let's have a, a vulnerable emotional one or, and then I, I go further i'd heard that john hammond when he was recording ray charles once had got a call to say Ray Charles's mother had died and he took the phone out to Ray at the piano and Ray got the news and and John said look we can cancel the session and do it another day if you want to grieve you know no problem and Ray went no let it roll and then he made one of his greatest albums ever yeah and and it became this homage to his mother and the emotional weight of the moment you know so sometimes I might say to a singer oh imagine your mother's just died and you're singing this song to her singing like that do a yeah. take like that and they'll be like what the fuck and i could just you know because it's it's like getting your head outside of the box of where you think it is or you and playing you know you know and you're also trying to extract a performance from them they're Absolutely. not just singing into a microphone in a studio you're looking for the best yeah. emotional response to to the music in that moment yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me ask you, you know, get back to Killing Joke here for a minute, because you know, I've 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 read and have seen a lot of interviews with uh, with Jazz. I've never had the chance to interview him myself, but I always get the sense that he's an incredibly complex figure. You know, on on one hand, he's absolutely brilliant, both you know musically and and, and certainly intellectually, and you combine that with his the intensity of his personality and and the occasional history of. Of, of self-sabotage in, in a way. And at the same time, he's exceptionally charming and, 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 and disarming at the same time. <laughs> How do you describe having a relationship with a guy that intense and, and that complex and then keep it going for more than just a few days at a time? Unreal. Unreal. <laughs> Surreal. Unreal. Um, you nailed it, actually. Uh, yeah, it's... As you can imagine, and I'm just articulated, it's got to be a mission impossible. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's very difficult. And it's not just jazz. We all have self-sabotaging elements in our characters with Killing Joe. Um, we tend to take it in terms... Jazz says I'm worse than him if you talk to him. About <laughs> <it>. <laughs> but uh, I know it's it's very, it's very difficult. And... Um, I I used to we all we we all used to just deal with it by being whoever could be the most aggressive and shout the loudest would get their way you know or the longest you know and it's still like that actually you know <laughs> but that's okay because that means if the idea or whatever we're talking about is really that important and someone will really push for it and if you know and eventually if they feel that strongly about it it will probably happen so but it is rare that we agree on anything and uh we often go to you know great expense to do something record a show or something and then jazz just go oh, i wouldn't like that show i don't want to do it and you know <laughs> you know the self-sabotaging killing joe is unreal um and it's incredible we're still together and still able to work together i mean the amount of um betrayals and personal stuff that's gone on within us over the years would split many bands up forever oh i'm know? sure and we've in a weird way it's actually bonded us and you know like what carlos again was saying what what my intentions are in life i want those belly laughs i want big belly laughs i don't want blah 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 uh you know chuckle <laughs> chuckle i want big belly laughs uh make you cry with pleasure and joy and you only get that from really deep emotional honest relationships you have what's great with killing joke is we all know each other so well we can always be brutally honest we all have to watch it now because we're a little more older and sensitive and we can react differently <laughs> uh, to that brutal honesty but sure. it's there and but that actually allows you to really be yourself in many ways yeah uh, you think it would actually kind of bully you into a corner but pushes you to come back fighting sometimes and, and you get and you get those last week we have some of the best times i ever have had as 
recently with with jazz on tour and, you know and, and we'll, we'll have a really really great time and uh and find great humor and things that only we find humor in. and to do it collectively is a is is a great reward and, and privilege you know and yeah. I, I have to remind the band that when it's tough when it's going the other way i have to say look we're actually in this amazingly privileged position to be able to be with people that are that honest with each other you know but it's incredibly challenging and it's taken me 50 years plus of studying psychology and my own <laughs> you know doing therapy doing all the spiritual work i could think of um so, you know going through the fire many times to be able to be in the, a room with them and be able to do it and make yeah. that work you know it's it's, it's incredible let me ask you about uh, Jordy here real quick, because you know, I'm one of the people that truly believes that this is maybe one of the most criminally underrated guitar players maybe in history. And the guy for since the beginning has just been a flat out devastating guitar player. And he doesn't get mentioned in the way that you know some others do. Musically speaking, and having worked with so many great musicians over the years, where do you rank Jordy as a guitar player? Wow, well, yeah, I mean, I think... Geordie is really top 10, you know, influential, innovative guitarists in the last 50 years. And I think a lot of people do recognize that. He has a devotional following and a big part of Killing Jokes fan base are obsessed with him. And he has that, he has a very unique sound. Then you look at his contemporaries and even his, some of his heroes, Jeff Beck covering Killing Joke with uh, Johnny Depp recently. Uh, yeah. Alice Cooper. I mean, those are great testaments to somebody's uh, quality. And, uh, you know, Nirvana, Nick in our riffs, you know, I mean, and the influential influence of Killing Joke from Ministry to Soundgarden to all over the place is well documented. So I think he thrives on having that acknowledgement. Yeah. But being quite indifferent to it as well. I mean, he's. He's not chasing that. He's so Geordie is absolutely one of the most coolest people you'll ever meet. Yeah. Um, he's like a character out of um, a Raymond Chandler novel or something, you know, <laughs> from a different time and era. But like the rest of us, he can be incredibly self-sabotaging personally and with the band, you know, as much as all of us can. Yeah. And it'd be just as difficult as jazz uh, and me. So, you know, um, and also creatively, it's very hard. Once he gets locked into his sound, it's hard to get him to experiment and do different things in the studio. Nevertheless, an incredible writer, um, an incredible musician and um, great guitarist. Yeah. I mean, formidable and, and and was always formidable. But for me, joining the band at 18, you know, jazz had been in orchestras, playing violin. Paul was well studied in his drums geordie was grade eight cello when he was 12 you know i'm all self-taught um so i had to really up my game musically and i learned so much and i continue to learn so much from them all yeah um you know when i do my solo albums which are more like 60s psychedelic folk jazz gives me advice on how to project my voice and and I'm trying to sound like Nick Drake, and he's going louder, louder. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Nick Drake needed that kind of uh, encouragement. <laughs> yeah, but even though it's it's a tough love we have, it is supportive, and we are all on the same side. And it reminds me of um, one of those a new Motown documentary I was watching, and um, the competition between the producers in house and the writers with. Um, getting their songs you know the you know one producer had done my girl and then the next producer <laughs> said well, i'm gonna do my guy you know you know very good he was like hey, kind of you know my my brother-in-law my father my, you know. but when he heard it, it was like yeah it's gonna be and it was a bigger hit yeah and that kind of comp competitiveness can really up your game and we have a lot of that within killing joke and geordie would do it if i'm like god i have to come up with something better than that <laughs> You know, um, and, you know, and it just with my bass, I have to come up with great bass lines. Otherwise, Geordie was showing me one, you know. Right. And um, <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, it's definitely, and it's been a big part of my process and philosophy is to surround myself with 
incredible musicians and 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 engineers and other people who have incredible talent because it makes me look good, you know. And <laughs> my job as a producer is to make the band look good. My job as a bass player is to make the guitarist and the singer look good. I, you know, I get that, you know. And even if you're in that supportive role, it's still a really important and difficult role to fulfill sometimes. So Killing Joke finished touring a few months ago. You, there was an EP that came out uh, last year, Lords of Chaos. There hasn't been a new album since since 2015 with Pylon. What's the status of, of Killing Joke moving forward? Is there a, a plan to record again, or you know, where yeah, do things we stand? Do. Yeah, we have a plan to record in uh, September, October. But whether we get to that point and it happens or not, I don't know. We've had many plans to record over the last few years, and it's not <laughs> happened. Um, and uh, yeah, you haven't had a, a good oh, moment of haven't had a good moment of self sabotage in quite a while. Oh, no, 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 that's not true. Not not ones that you're aware of, but I am. <laughs> I go through emails today that are like, I wincingly self-sabotage. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I just have to have a philosophy with Killing Joe. I, I feel grateful I'm not totally reliant on that band for everything because then I would be like slashing my wrists in frustration. Uh, and if that stuff happens now, I kind of just have to engage in a practice of patience and just let it right. work itself out of course without you know trying to you force it um and and flow with it and see what happens and it does happen anyway in its own way so i'm happy to do that but i you know i've been i've got like 25 killing joke demos i want to get the band to attack Paul, big paul's got a few geordie has got a few so we've got a lot of ideas whether we can engage jazz into those ideas and you know, beyond, I don't know. You know, we'll have to see. <laughs> but I think because we've left it for a while, sometimes when we just like land on it, it just comes and it's like, wow, we just have to plug in and stand in the room together. It just happens. Wow. I'm sure that may happen as well. I'm, I, 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 we, we're, we, we need a new album now and uh, we, it's, a, it's important we do that. So I, I'm, I'm, personally pushing for it and have been and whether that I, I don't know if that ep will be on it but you know we'll who knows yeah martin I, this has been so much fun and 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 a real honor to talk to you like i said i've i've been a killing joke fan for you know a, a better part of the the whole run and to, to spend some time with you has been a, a real thrill so thank you so much my pleasure thanks for having me and uh all the best for that yeah we appreciate it well, have a good evening and uh, keep keep rocking those uh, podcasts out, man. I really enjoy it. I watched one the other day that you do with your your partner. Um, oh it's yeah, a different show. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a different personality. Yeah, well, it's it's it is a little bit different. I'm focused on more things than just than just music. But yeah, we've been doing that. We've been doing this uh, show for 28 years in uh, in Massachusetts. So yeah. good long Amazing. time. Yeah, I know. Wow, wow. Well, I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, there was one I was listening to the other day. Was, you, you were going on about the, the pros and cons of foot fetishes. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> and I, I actually just watched that Dust to Dawn <laughs> movie that Tarantino wrote, where yeah. he wrote an amazing scene with, with Salma Hayek doing a strip, <laughs> and, and he gets to have the foot fetish thing. Uh, and I think you were saying, I don't know about Fee, I don't get Fee. And I was like, you obviously haven't seen that scene recently. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you had, you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> right. But I thought it was really entertaining. Well, thank you. Um, and um, yeah, so thanks for having me. And yeah, best of luck with it. Totally my pleasure. Good to meet you. Yeah. Thank Cheers. you very much. Have a great night. So what we've learned is this. If Martin Glover can tell all his friends about the podcast, so can you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to share it, like it, rate it, let everybody know about it. You can follow me on all the social media stuff and email me at backsatrock102.com. I'd love to know what you think. Thanks to ZM Home Buyers for their support, and thank you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.